Hi everyone, I hope you're doing well. In this lecture, we'll pick up right where we left off uh, discussing amphibian development. Recall that in the last lecture, we discussed the specification of the different germ layers and we began discussing the specification of the different axes of the body. And experiments that were carried out by Hans Spemann and Hilde Mangold were essential for understanding that process. Recall that one of Spemann's early experiments involved ligating an early nude blastula using a human hair. And he did this at the zygote stage, and he did so in a way that he would basically split up the gray crescent amongst the two sides of the constriction because he ligated it up parallel to the plane of the first cleavage. So recall that the first cleavage basically divides the gray crescent between the two resulting blastomeres. So Spemann's ligation was parallel to this plane of this first cleavage. Now he then constricted the egg so that nuclear divisions would only happen on one side of the embryo. After a period of time, sometimes as late as the 16 cell stage, one of the nuclei would manage to escape the constriction and move into the region that did not previously house any nuclei. And at that point, the cleavage would begin at this side as well. Now, when the two sides were fully separated by pulling tightly on the hair, two genetically identical larvae would develop with one being more developed than the other, as you can see in this image. Now, from these results, Spemann speculated that the nuclei of the early amphibian embryo were equivalent and thus were capable of giving rise to normal larvae. However, when this experiment was performed so that the constriction still passed through both the animal and the vegetal poles, but was instead perpendicular to the plane of the first cleavage, and thus separated the future dorsal and the future ventral sides of the embryo so that one side received the great crescent and the other one did not, only the side that received the great crescent cytoplasm or the future dorsal side was able to give rise to a normal larva. The other side produced a mass of disorganized ventral cells, and that's what's labeled here as the belly piece. And the belly piece actually contained tissues from all three germ layers, but it lacked all dorsal structures, including the notochord and the nervous system. Now recall that the first cleavage plane normally splits the gray crescent equally between the two blastomeres. Now if we were to separate these cells, two complete larvae would develop. But if the gray crescent material passes into only one of the cells, but not the other, then only the one, the blastomere that contains the gray crescent, develops normally. So there's something in the region of the gray crescent that is essential for normal embryonic development in amphibians. And indeed, the gray crescent region gives rise to the cells that become the dorsal lip of the blastopore. So this is the site where gastrulation begins. And this dorsal lip of the blastopore is essential for the formation of the notochord, which induces the formation of the nervous system. And this dorsal lip of the blastopore is also needed for the formation of the head endoderm and the head mesoderm. Additional transplantation experiments performed by Spemann using embryos that had different pigmentations so that they could identify host and donor tissues based on their color show that during gastrulation, the differentiation potential of cells becomes gradually restricted. Specifically, he showed that the cells of the early gastrula are uncommitted. So in one experiment, Spemann transplanted a region of the prospective neural ectoderm. So this is a region that was normally would give rise to the nervous system of the organism. So he took this from an early gastrula of one newt species and he transplanted that to a region that normally gives rise to the ventral epidermis in a second new species. And as you can see in this image, the transplanted cells, which would have normally become dorsal neural tissue, were able to adopt a new ventral epidermal fate corresponding to this new environment. Now the reverse, the reverse of this was also true. Presumptive epidermal cells can give rise to neural tissue if they're transplanted to the region where the neural tissue normally forms. Collectively, these experiments show that the cells of the early nude gastrula exhibit conditional specification, so their fate depends on their location in the embryo.
In other words, the cells of the early gastrula are uncommitted. Although the cells of the early gastrula are uncommitted, the fates of the late gastrula are determined. So if we were to transplant the cells from the presumptive neural ectoderm from one late nude gastrula to the region that normally gives rise to the presumptive ventral epidermis of a second nude gastrula, we would see that a neural plate would form instead. So at this later stage of gastrulation, the cells are no longer able to alter their fate in response to being placed in a new environment. So at this point, the fate of the cells has become determined. So there are crucial changes in cell potency that happen during gastrulation. In spite of that, there was one special region in the early gastrula that was shown by Spemann and Mangle to be determined autonomously. And this one region is the dorsal lip of the blastopore, which is the tissue that's derived from the gray crescent cytoplasm that's opposite to the site of sperm entry. If you look at panel A, you'll see that we're looking at an early gastrula. Now, as I just mentioned, previous experiments had shown that the fates of the cells in the early gastrula are uncommitted. However, this is not the case for the dorsal blastopore lip. Now, when this tissue is transplanted to the presumptive belly region of another gastrula, it not only continues to be a dorsal blastopore lip, but it also actually can initiate gastrulation and morphogenesis in the surrounding tissue to create an entire secondary axis. So the dorsal blastopore lip cells, when transplanted, invaginated as they normally would have done, and went on to differentiate into the notochord and other structures that are normally derived from the dorsal blastopore lip. Additionally, these dorsal blastopore lip cells were able to alter the fate of the surrounding cells so that those cells would give rise to tissue types that they normally would not. Now, eventually, a secondary embryo form conjoined at the face with its host. Spemann and Mangold call this region of the dorsal blastopore lip the amphibian organizer. So the amphibian organizer is composed of those dorsal lip cells and the derivatives of those cells, specifically the notochore and the head endomesoderm. As you have seen, the amphibian organizer can induce a new site of gastrulation so that a secondary dorsal ventral and anterior to posterior axis form when this tissue is transplanted to a new host. Additionally, the organizer has the ability to change the fate of surrounding cells. Specifically, it dorsalizes tissue. So in the ectoderm, that would mean that the tissue would form neural tissue as opposed to epidermis. It can also transform the ventral mesoderm into lateral and dorsal mesoderm. As we'll see later, the ability of the organizer and particularly the notochord, which is part of the organizer, and that's what you see here underneath the neural tube, to induce the dorsalization of the ectoderm into neural tissue is actually tied to early events that happened uh, prior to, the, to gastrulation. Now, for now, take a look at this video of what Spemann and Mangold would have observed as they performed their transplantation experiments.